How many times can a man start again to pack up, hit the road and try another version of his dream? Does there come an age when one must simply bow to the passage of time, accept that lady luck may pass only once and then fade away for those who do not ride with her unflinching optimism? I could have left a week ago, but I feel stuck. The first step is usually the hardest and the most rewarding, but this time I feel nothing but dread. I know once I start that engine, there'll be no turning back. I know I will stubbornly persevere regardless, facing that remote wasteland, to be alone with myself. I got into motorcycles later in life. There is a particular delight in cruising along a country road, the sun on your back, the smell of the fields engulfing your senses. A great euphoria in turning the throttle and feeling the engine growl to life as every inch of your being navigates the next corner. You know that at any moment everything could go terribly wrong and your life could be put in danger and that only seems to add to the excitement. So I decide I will head west, see the parts of my country I have not yet encountered, a bike, a tent, a monkey and a camera, a Suzuki DR650 that I like to call the doctor. I once made enough money on YouTube to have traveled for near two years. Luck gave me a chance to get in early. I saw the potential of a global audience, but that is all past now. A whole new generation have taken the mantle. Maybe this trip will help me work out what I do next as I approach middle age. I've been staying with my dad while preparing my bike. I've changed from a man afraid to do his own mechanical work to a man who now enjoys knowing things are done right. This has been an important stage in my pre-trip preparation to trust myself to pull things apart and put things back together. The morning of the day I decide to leave, I couldn't have asked for better weather. I make a little collection of all the things I want to take with me in the living room. Trying to get that all onto the bike proves more difficult than I first thought. With everything finally loaded onto my trusty mule, I head off late afternoon, say goodbye to Dad, and give him a hug instead of the usual formal handshake. I do one last lap of the main street, and then hit the open road. The doctor is handling well under the weight, but does seem to pull up a bit slower. I travel through a blur of small towns, some doing well, some not so well. I make a plan to visit two country pubs, the Harrow Pub, built in 1848, and the Aspley Pub, which has free camping. As I get closer to Harrow, I notice a pleasant change in the surroundings. Huge red gum trees stand like ancient sentinels watching over the country. The distance between letterboxes and the imposing entrance gateways make me aware these farms aren't hobby farms. These holdings have serious acreage. I get to the Harrow pub around 6.30pm. As Aspley is 45 minutes away, I decide to only have one drink and ride on. Harrow is one of the original inland settlements of Victoria, but its glory days are long behind it. I take it slow, 80 to 90, assessing the landscape. Not much roadkill, still fairly warm, but still a risk. I pan the landscape for any sign of active wildlife. I see a wallaby or two, and then have some luck. A woman in a small four-wheel drive passes me, and I decide to tailgate her into Eden Oak. 110, 120, she's going a fair click, but I keep close to her tail. If a roo jumps out, her car will be my barrier. I make it to Aspley and head straight to the bar to order a meal before closing. Local Dooler Downs lamb shoulder, with a sweet pumpkin puree, Brussels sprouts, pine nuts and feta. It is delicious, quite impressive for a rural pub. The Border Inn only recently opened in 2014, after laying unoccupied for three years. Twelve local farming families joined together to run the pub, concerned that losing it 
would be a death knell for the local community. Later that night, the pub is pretty quiet with only two patrons, and only one being local. He told me he remembers a day when the pub was so full, he had to get served on the footpath through a window. Talk turns to investment funds buying up local land at exorbitant prices, and the further destruction this has on the local population. It makes me wonder what the future holds for an Australia where most of its citizens reside in major cities. I wake to the incessant chattering of a caucus of cockatoos, a fine dew covering everything I didn't put in the tent. I decide to take the inland route to Keith. The surrounding landscape is desolate and flat. I pass through little town after little town, most appearing to just be outposts, relying on passing traffic for their subsistence. I pull into a Belgium waffle shop. What a great idea, something different from the usual pie and sauce. I ride onto the Barossa Valley. I feel a strong side wind blowing from the coast and up ahead dark clouds line the horizon. When one first starts riding a bike, these side winds can be quite disconcerting. Sometimes they can violently catch your helmet or bike, making it sway to one side. But after some experience, you get used to this turbulence and brace a little towards the wind to counter its force. I approach a curvy uphill run, a biker's dream. The barometer has dropped, and to my left, I see a storm front. I hope I can outrun it and avoid any rain. The doctor seems to enjoy the drop in temperature, and I give her a rev, and she responds with a pleasing growl. I let out a manical laugh. (laughs) These are the rides I live for, powering into an uphill corner, swaying from left to right, feeling part of nature, in it, the whole visceral experience, the smell of roadkill, the whack of an insect splattering on my helmet. I pass the rise and head down into the Eden Valley. The trees appear to bow over the road as I pass them. The Eden and Barossa Valleys were settled by English and German free settlers, and as I drive through a local town, I see signs of German heritage, sausage shops, and German language signs. I find a place to camp in a vineyard and dig into a light dinner of saddlebag cheese, crackers, and tomato. The cheese has gone two days now without refrigeration, and has a greenish opacity and slimy texture. Another two days and it should be fully matured. I hit the road and there is a smell of fresh rain, of burnt ash from a recent fire and the cleansing eucalyptus scent of wet gum trees. I love this smell. It is like the smell of nature revitalised. It looks like rain so I set up camp early at Riney, an old Cobb and Co rest stop which still has the original 1860s pub. As night fell, the heavens opened. It literally rains the whole night. That morning, I tentatively look out of my tent to see if the doctor is still covered with the tarp I haphazardly threw over it before sundown. Luckily, there wasn't much wind, and everything is still covered. I decide to just lay there and wait for a break. I fare pretty well after my first major test of all-night rain, My tent, of course, is saturated, but everything else has remained dry. I ride on towards Clare, light rain still falling. One can nearly see the country coming alive, green specks replacing the rust-coloured fields. I take a detour to Mintaro, a heritage town. I go into a local pub where I meet a Landra, a Belgian backpacker on a two-year working holiday. We get talking for ages, and she tells me that for a visit, She only stays in very small rural towns, avoiding the cities. This is where you meet the real people. There is a genuine feeling of community, and I love that, she tells me. I think about Alandra's statement. Australia has changed so much in the last few decades, particularly our cities. You really do have to get out into the country to see the old Australia, the Australia of the pioneers. I get into Clare and find a $35 room above the middle pub. It is too small to swing a monkey and fairly stuffy, but with a fan on at night and wholesome $10 pub meals downstairs, 
It suits me just fine. I have a contact to meet in Clare, and at 5.30pm I head to the Taminga pub to meet Gary, a retired gentleman whose father lives in the same town my father lives in. I'm made aware that Taminga has a fairly elaborate seating protocol, dictating where regulars sit at given times and on given days. Seat 1, for example, is Gary's seat. Seat 2 is Napa's seat, unless Rowley is present. Seat 3 is primarily undesignated, except for on Wednesdays, when it is used by Smokey. Unfortunately, Aussie pub culture is dying off. It was a place a man could go and let off some steam, have a laugh and learn the local goings-on. It's now just become too expensive, partly due to a six-monthly government excise called the Syntax. The next morning I get up and do a bit of maintenance on the doctor before setting off to taste some of the local wine. On my little tour, I find places to eat with magnificent views and a brewery that produces a tonic ale with orange and lemon peel, fresh coriander and ginger from a hundred-year-old recipe. But the highlight of the day is a chance visit to a twilight market in Seven Hills, a local event where producers sell their wares, everything from fresh produce to cakes and relishes. It really represents to me what a vibrant community the Clare Valley is, colourful characters and delicious tastings. To find a place where people still have a connection to the earth and what it grows. It's really wonderful and my only regret is I can't buy all these delicacies and take them with me, as many wouldn't survive saddlebag temperatures. The next morning I meet up with Gary and we head 43 kilometres northeast towards the historic mining town of Burra. Burra was one of Australia's first mining settlements with the discovery of copper in 1845. At the time it supplied 15% of the world's copper and was credited with keeping the fledgling South Australian colony financially afloat. What I found fascinating about the place was that most of the miners were Cornish. Can you imagine what hell it must have been for them? Moving from the green fields and coastal views of Cornwall to this barren, endless hell? To live in holes dug in the side of creeks to escape the searing heat? Their huge moustaches, the fashion of the day, drooping in the constant swelter. We then went out of town a bit in search of Goida's line. Goida was a surveyor who was assigned the task of working out where the good earth ends and the desert begins. Goida surmised that where the salt bush begins, so too does the start of the low rainfall country, unsuitable for planting crops. For me it's fascinating that only 50 kilometres away there are the rolling hills and vineyards of Clare, and yet out to the northern horizon there is nothing but flat earth, the mythical outback. We head back past Clare to visit Martindale Hall, a lavish 32-room Georgian-style mansion modelled on an English country estate. It was built in 1880 by Edmund Bowman from a princely inheritance. Specialist tradesmen were brought over from England to complete the handcrafted black and white marble fireplaces and the ornate black wood and oak hand-carved staircase. But by 1891, 11 years later, Poor Edmund had blown all his cash. Australia was a different beast from the mother country and drought and a downturn in the wool prices ended his dream of becoming one of the landed gentry. I ride on towards Port Pirie. I'm enjoying the riding. I find it quite relaxing, like a meditation. When you get out on these roads where the scenery is beautiful, it is a really nice sensation to just be passing through the country. Thoughts arise and fall, memories recalled, a dreamlike state. You get into a kind of flow, man and bike moving as one. Port Pirie is an industrial smelter town. As an outsider, I notice a lot of for sale and for lease signs. But from what the Port Redevelopment Marketing says, Port Pirie is on the rise. I drop into a local cafe in a building that was once a church. 
I get talking to the owner, Saeed, an Iranian who came to Australia as an illegal asylum seeker on a crowded fishing boat. He spent 27 months in detention centres, but was lucky to have a local family take him under their wing and offer him work as a dishwasher. He married a local woman, had kids, and was offered the finance by his father-in-law to convert the old church into a cafe. He now employs 22 people and has just won South Australian Regional Barista for the third year running. A great story and an interesting insight into Australia's changing demographics. Around 7 million out of the 24 million of Australia's population were born overseas. This equates to roughly 30%. Compare that with the USA, which has 13%, the UK, 12%, and Germany, 8%. In Sydney, a phenomenal 42% of the population were born overseas. I find a camp on an empty salt lake just out of town. As the sun sets, it lights up the sky with a myriad of colours. To look out to the west, there is nothing but flat horizon as far as the eye can see. Then came the mosquitoes, hundreds of them. I must have been the only human for kilometres. The sound is like nothing I've ever heard, an angry insistent buzz. The next morning I go about taking my tent down with my helmet and gloves on. It is the only way to avoid the swarming hordes. Due to my haste, I forget I'm on a soft surface and have my bike stand sink fully into the sand as I'm loading it. Oh great, hordes of mosquitoes, my bike on its side and the hot sun slowly rising. Hopefully the sun will vanquish these evil vampiric bloodsuckers. I try to lift my bike a couple of times, removing as much gear as I can, the stand acting like an anchor, making things harder. I take off my helmet, gloves and jacket. I swallow a mosquito, then suck one up my left nostril. I buckle over and retch up the annoying critters. Oh God, they are like a black angry cloud fighting over my bare flesh. I have to do this, there is no one to help. With all my might, mosquitoes viciously circling my head and attacking my face and neck, I managed to get to my knees and put all my weight into lifting the beast. A little sweaty, I take off, vowing never to camp on a salt pan again, regardless of how beautiful its unbroken horizons make the sunsets. I'm finding clever ways to camp out in the bush and still maintain some level of cleanliness. The balmy weather allows me to take a swim on dusk at Solomon Town Beach and then rinse off with a beachside freshwater shower. As I sat there watching the sunset, I think about how little we really need to be happy. I ride on to Wyala, which is like Port Augusta, a one-trick industrial city. All bad news, the steelworks closing, the town's future in question. I then hit the flatlands, straight roads stretch to the horizon. You take a turn, and then another straight road stretching to the horizon. The landscape is flat and uninspiring. I took this route because I was lured by what the tourism brochures call the seafood trail. Eat your way around the coast, I'm starting to feel it was a bit of a gimmick, but I suppose at least these roads will prepare me for my next challenge, the Nullarbor, a 1200 kilometre stretch of nothingness. After a solid day of riding, I start looking for a place to camp. I head towards the coast, not really knowing what I'd find. I come across a little place called Port Gibbon that has a campsite but it is full of grey nomads and their flash caravans and brand new fully decked out four wheel drives. I actually feel safer and prefer to camp out alone. I just like being surrounded by the sounds of nature. So I ride on down the coast and find a great little track that leads me to the edge of the continent where I watch the sun slowly set and light up the sky. I then ride a little further on and decide to set up right on the beach, the sound of the surf lulling me to sleep. I finally arrive in Port Lincoln, the seafood capital of Australia. Time to get busy eating the sea's bounty. 
Straight away I get some Coffin Bay oysters, which I devour there and then using my pannier as a table. I eat enough seafood to last a week, and later visit a local Italian restaurant to try a seafood pizza with local prawns and calamari, washed down with a cleansing Cooper's beer. It's nearly worth passing through all that barren landscape. I'm getting used to camping out, but at the moment, the hardest thing for me is just before going to bed, those sunset hours where I'm alone. Not everyone can handle solo travel. It takes a particular fortitude, but I must be honest, I still have all my toys, my laptop, my phone. I do feel I'm starting to slow down a little bit though. I do a big run up the coast, resorting to old tricks, trying to stretch as much riding into my day as I can by tailing a four-wheel drive for 90 kilometres to avoid the ruse. I see this church complete with white picket fence in the middle of nowhere. I pull in to have a look and find it open, the door swinging in the breeze. I go inside and it looks as though it's still being used. This is what used to make up a town, a church, a hall, a pub and a general store. I find the Sharinga General Store next door. It has a makeshift bar serving cans. It's an interesting enough setup that I decide to have a beer before setting off to find a camp for the night. Then I met Lewis. Lewis recently moved to the area, lured by cheap land. He has an interesting history and may well have chose Sharinga because it was a bit of an outpost, free from such trappings of civilization as law and order. We talk past midnight, and by this stage, I've had a few more beers, so the owner graciously lets me stay in a caravan out the back. Of our hours of talk, I will reveal but one story. Once Lewis was working as a surveyor in the Western Desert, a remote place called Lake Mackay near the border of the Territory and West Australia. He spied through his looking glass the last of a nomadic people, several men and women, not a thread of clothing, carrying various Stone Age implements. That was 1981. I find stories like this fascinating, that even after 200 plus years of British colonialism, there are still pockets of country so remote, so harsh, that people can remain hidden. I'm told the next morning I should visit Sharinga Beach and its sand dunes. I take some back roads along the coast and find a nice left hand to surf break with only four mates sharing waves. I used to surf in my 20s and one of my aims on this trip is to once again try surfing. I meander up the coast in no real hurry, stopping off at various spots and checking the stunning scenery. At most places I have the entire coastline to myself. While in Sharinga, I saw a coffee table book they had on display about the mythical desert surf break called Cactus. There was a line in it that resonated with me. It is important, from time to time, to slow down, to go away by yourself and simply be. Only then will nature reveal her secrets. I really felt terribly unimportant as I observed the beauty around me. Nature just doesn't give a damn about me or my stupid little goals and dreams. It just carries on regardless. My focus changes. I see tracks in the sand from the creatures of the night. I see a myriad of life in these dunes. I watch two caterpillars, one behind the other, march across the parched earth, the wind sporadically knocking them over. Do they have a god, I thought? Do they think they are better than other caterpillars? based on their colour or creed. Out here I feel the indifference of the universe. Out here it is the rule of nature that is important, not man-made philosophies. My new rear tyre has a worrying bald spot. It could be a number of things, an unbalanced rim being my first deduction. There would be nowhere on my next leg of travel, one of the most fabled in Australia, where I'd be able to replace it. Not sure what happens when a tyre gets bald? Will it slide? Will it blow out? All I knew is it wasn't the best place to happen, just before embarking on the epic nullarbor.
The Nullarbor is 1,200 kilometres of nothing but desert. It means treeless plain in Latin, or in Aboriginal, Ondiri, the waterless. Past my first road train, a two-carriage truck lugging supplies across the vast expanse. I take a line a little too close for comfort, feeling the pull of the slipstream sucking me towards 24 wheels of rolling death. Lesson learnt, take a wide berth on the next pass and tuck in tight to avoid the turbulence. I find a dirt road heading straight to the edge of the continent. The coastline here drops dramatically into the ocean forming magnificent cliffs. To stand there, on the edge of the continent, hearing the waves smashing the rocks below, to be close enough to feel the fear, is well worth the detour. One would think that riding the Nullarbor is a bore, an endurance in which the reward is to finish. But one morning, I found myself at peace in this barren space. There is a simplicity in this landscape, a purity, a silence. It's a bit like motorcycle travel. You need to get rid of the unnecessary to only have what is needed. I want my life to be like this landscape, simplified. I don't want a lot of noise. I want to find the purity. I'm about to hit Australia's longest straight stretch of road, 146.6 kilometres of gun barrel straight highway. And in a strange twist of fate, the heavens decide to open up. You realise that after about two hours of riding in constant rain, nothing is waterproof. The moisture just starts to soak in. I feel a wetness run down the front zip of my leather jacket, wetting my chest and trickling down my front, forming into a moist cold puddle at my crutch. My boots become buckets, my gloves become sponges, and all the while I'm trying to see the road through a fogged up visor, hoping my bald tyre doesn't lose traction, or a kangaroo, camel or cow doesn't decide to wander onto the road and drink from the puddles. This is not fun, it's downright unpleasant, but it is in these moments that I become aware that I can handle this, and this is a nice place to be, to realise that all my fears, hitting an animal, losing control, Having a tyre blow out, no matter what, I can handle it. The rain in the desert makes a desert of my mind, freeing me of unfounded fears and making me aware of my own strengths and capabilities. And in the end, this is the best one can learn from any journey, to learn more about oneself. I stay overnight in Belladonia, in one of their cabins to dry my gear, and meet Peter, staying next door. We decide to ride the last 200 kilometres of the Nullarbor together. Peter had ridden his GS650 from Rockhampton in Queensland, and was fulfilling a lifelong goal in his 70th year. He rode with an open face helmet and no gloves, which would have made things interesting when we got a bit of rain up the road. He told me, I once worked with a guy in the government. He was just about to retire, and all he could talk about was his half a million dollar super fund. He was dead within four months of retiring. I didn't want that to happen to me, so I want to do things when I still can. I decide to head to Kalgoorlie, in order to get a new tyre fitted. Kalgoorlie was a place that had fascinated me. I heard it was a rough and ready mining town with 50 pumps and barmaids called skimpies that get around in little more than their underwear. I'd also heard of Hay Street, the red light district, which used to host 18 working brothels. What I found was a town whose glory days were long behind it. Yes, the buildings were magnificent, the pubs, huge museums to Australia's drinking culture, ornately fitted with chandeliers and statues of sirens riding dolphins, 
but many of the grand old buildings were in disrepair, or even those with a fresh coat of paint were no longer serving their original purpose. And the infamous Hay Street now only had two brothels, and one only surviving by opening its doors to tourists, giving them an insight into the salacious business of prostitution. I took the tour guided by Carmel, a madam for 24 years, with the most ridiculous posh English accent I'd ever heard. I was told of women in the 1960s, earning enough to be able to buy a new house every month. I heard stories of girls taking 70 clients a day, but alas, she said, most girls wasted their limited working life on cheap jewels, expensive clothes and overseas holidays. She said now all a working girl needed was a mobile phone and an ad in the newspaper. I met Beck at a local pub. She drove a truck in the super pit. I rudely asked her how much she earned, hearing tales of the big dollars the mining industry offered. About a hundred thousand, she told me, with about thirty thousand going to the tax man. Beck told me the mine preferred employing females to drive the trucks as they were gentler on the machinery. They even had hours set up that allowed mums to collect their kids from school. I silently smiled to myself and thought, 20 years ago, women earned their money in Kalgoorlie on their backs. Now, they earn it sitting on their bums. With a new knobby tyre fitted, I head down to Esperance on the coast. I arrive fairly late and head out on the aptly named Great Ocean Drive. This stretch of road along the coastline is absolutely stunning and I can't wait to explore it more in the morning, but for now I must find a campsite. On the Tourist Information Centre they'd put up a notice about illegal camping and a hundred dollar on the spot fines, so I have to be a little bit wily in my choice of site. I head down a sand track towards the beach thankful for my new knobby tyre as I plough through deep sand under load. The next day I get perfect weather and do a full run along the beach road, kilometres of perfect empty beaches. Esperance has a weird feel about it. It doesn't really feel like a real town. It feels more like a holiday resort for the mining industry. I head east towards Cape Le Grand National Park I find a place to camp in a burnt out forestry plantation. That morning I look out my tent and see a family of emus approaching. They see me and bolt off towards the plantation, but then they turn back just wanting another look. A farmer once told me that emus are extremely inquisitive and if one was to stand in the middle of a paddock waving a flag they'd just have to come and have a look. I then hear the telltale screech of black cockatoos. I wander into a burnt out section of acacia trees. The cockatoos feed on their seeds. I see the scout bird higher in the trees looking out for danger. He sees me and lets out a warning cry to the mob. They take off forming a black raucous cloud. Cape Le Grand National Park has a unique beach called Lucky Bay where a mob of kangaroos actually frequent the squeaky white sands. Over the years they've become used to the human visitors and can be patted and photographed with ease. I noticed they nibbled on the seaweed and even seemed to be eating some unidentified sea life washed up on the shore. This is such a beautiful part of the world, so pristine and remote. I really am so lucky to be in the position to be able to explore it at my leisure. From Esperance I head towards Albany. The nights are getting a little cooler now, but my planning has proven successful, my merino wool clothing keeping the chill out. About 25 kilometres out of Albany, I see something I haven't seen for a while, and I must say I've missed. Rolling green fields and tall tree forests. I roll into Albany and decide to book a room in a hostel. I find one on Stirling Terrace, which features impressive colonial architecture. Albany is a port city, 
and the oldest settlement in Western Australia. I instantly warm to the place. It feels like a real town, not just some place created because of a money pit in the ground. It has farmer and craft markets, cute French cafes and a charming vista overlooking the bay. I met an interesting crew at the hostel, a bunch of guys who all know each other. The philosopher Joe, Simon the Bavarian, Colin, the only other Aussie in the hostel, June the Korean prankster, and the enigmatic Kiran, who only briefly visits some nights and would always have his head in his computer. The hostel mainly catered for those working in town with visas. I'm lucky to spend a Friday night there, and it was a joy to experience the multicultural mix. Out the back were the Germans, drinking beer and heavy liquor. Move on into the kitchen to find Asians, mainly Koreans, drinking whiskey and hot chocolate. The kitchen is the scene of a Euro disco, with the Italians providing the beats. The girls weren't going anywhere, but made an effort to dress up anyway, as is the Italian style. And out the back, in the smoking section, you find the North Africans, keen to get you drunk on their liquor, and talk with a real Australian. The Aborigines called Albany Place of Rain and had an interesting settlement story. Makari, the local Nunga leader, welcomed the Europeans, showing them their walking trails, which have since become roads. He became close friends with the colony's doctor. When he died in 1831, he was buried behind the town hall. When Dr. Colley himself died of tuberculosis four years later, he wished to be buried beside his great friend Makari. I went in search of the gravesite, but alas found a senior citizen centre instead. Old bones and old bones. I later read the gravesite was exhumed and moved on to the Albany Cemetery. What a lost opportunity, a great story of two cultures coming together as one. No bloodshed, no problems. At least not until the question of who really owns the land was raised. I'm getting into some really beautiful country now, stunning coastlines and majestic forests. There is something really special about moving through a natural landscape on a motorcycle. It kind of puts you in a very relaxing state. You are still concentrating, but the immersion and moving through the surroundings seems to bring on a feeling of calmness and tranquility. The roads here are perfect for motorcycle touring, uphill and down dale, ancient forests on either side, that crisp, clean smell of nature. I reach a town called Warpool, which really ups the ante with regard to camping fines. A thousand dollars seems a little extravagant. I've now been camping out quite a bit, and I have developed a bit of a knack at finding sites where I won't be disturbed by pesky rangers. There is quite an art to motorcycle travel. You can only take a bare minimum of gear. I now have a routine in place, where every item has a unique spot in my limited luggage space. I visit the bicentennial tree, which offers a 75 metre climb to the top of the forest canopy. This 250 year old kari tree has had iron rods rammed into it, forming a circular staircase leading to a tower at the top. Originally these towers were used as a lookout for forest fires and now offer a unique tourist attraction something that has somehow escaped the age of public liability. There is no netting to stop one falling between the steps, and on the side, the only protection being a rather flimsy wire fence. I head up the tree, but found about a third of the way up, I became dizzy and nauseous. I head back down to terra firma. I see old ladies and six-year-olds climb the tree. I wasn't going to let it defeat me. Four more times I tried to climb, going a little further each time, But in the end, it just gave me a headache and made me feel ill. I didn't think I had a fear of heights, and yet my body just wouldn't let me climb. Is this what I have to look forward to as I get older, realising there are more and more things I will never be able to experience again? As I ride away defeated, feeling like an old fool, I squirt a little hard on the throttle, heading up a dirt rise. I slide in some loose gravel and head towards a tree. I realise with all the extra gear on my bike, my usual slight adjustments don't change my line. And for a moment, 
I lose control, slamming my foot on the rear brake to stop my trajectory. My thoughts are brought instantly to the moment, and I stop feeling sorry for myself. As a town, Margaret River didn't really impress me. It's not like Noosa or Lawn with a beautiful beach forest setting. It's a small inland town on a dirty brown river, 10 kilometres from the coast. Someone from Albany told me that the only reason it has such a tourism marketing buzz is because the wealthy of Perth have put a lot of money into its surrounds. I don't know how true this is, but when I visit a local art gallery and check out the prices on some of the furniture, I realise the region definitely has some people with a bit of coin. I meet one of the artists, Evelyn, a classically trained German jeweller, skilled in the centuries-old tradition of lamp-fired bohemian glass bead making. She found my forthright opinion about some of the art pieces amusing and taught me the best way to appreciate art you don't understand is to just say, hmm, this piece really speaks for itself. She found my journey of interest and we talked for quite a while, carrying on our conversation into the bar next door. I end up getting an invite to dinner, meet her daughter and learn more about how she ended up in Australia. She told me she likes Australia because it has less of a class system than Germany, a lot more wide open spaces and much less competition in business. She asked me why I'm not in a relationship and I tell her I don't want to lose my freedom. She says what could be more freeing than opening your heart to love. I end up spending some time at her place. It's nice, like a warm cocoon, a pleasant break from the constant ebb and flow of travel. We agree to meet in Broome early June. She used to live there and is visiting for business, purchasing South Sea pearls to accentuate her elegant jewellery. It's nice to be back on the road. There is a joy in seeing country for the first time that overrides all the hassles and hold-ups. Something about moving that helps freshen the mind. The actual acts of travelling, such as setting up camp every day, can become tiresome. But there is a newness in the unfamiliar. In this new landscape, I'm not tied to my past. I can be whatever I wish to be. I take the inland road from Nanup to Ballingup. It's beautiful country out here, and it's so nice to once again be surrounded by nature. On this trip, I wanted a bike that could take me anywhere, and I built it. A customised Mad Max Outback Apocalypse machine. I went to great lengths to ensure I have everything I need to be a self-contained unit, to be able to head out into the never-never, experience it, and return. I take the doctor off-road, heading up a logging track winding round a hilltop. I open her up a bit and she growls with approval, her back wheels spinning gravel and leaving the telltale furrows of a dirt bike under throttle. When we get back on the bitumen, she seems more spirited, the growl remaining, and despite seeing ruse in the half-cleared scrub by the side of the road, I give the perfect winding road its dues and push a little harder than usual. I was told Ballingup was a nimbin of the West and was expecting to find a town overrun with hippies dressed as druids and fairies, wandering out of the forest with haversacks full of magic mushrooms. But apart from seeing a cutesy statue of a red and white mushroom and the rather cryptic town cat cry of experience and magic, all I found was a sleepy forest village. So I decided to ride on to Bridgetown, where the local cidery is hosting a folk night. I find a small intimate gathering with log fire and cosy couches. A man with a white folky beard like Rolf Harris asks me if I play an instrument and when I tell him I have a tin whistle on my bike, I'm asked if I'd like to join the group on stage. It's great fun and I actually think we all sound pretty good, but I have sense enough to stand well back from the mic and not overpower the mix as I hadn't played the whistle for a number of years. I camp out that night and it's getting a little chilly. The leaves are turning to rust and the country is telling me it's time to fly north. There is a simplicity in motorcycle travel I really like. A lightness of being where you can only really carry the bare minimum. It makes you reflect on how little we really need to be happy.
I ride up to Fremantle and find it a buzz with markets and bookshops and street art and restaurants. I love the old architecture and book into a backpackers based solely on the beauty of its facade. It was once a grand three-storey hotel with in vino veritas stained glass windows and Greek columns, but it had the feel of a homeless shelter with most of the residents being long-termers like the stinky man I shared a room with. I met a street artist called Horatio T. Birdbath. I asked him to describe his favourite colour. He says vibrant, mellow and enigmatic. I say, that dear sir, is you. He's chuffed with my answer and lets me take a photo, telling me to make sure I get his quote, do justice to your talent. We talk about street art and he suggests I visit Lisbon in Portugal. He informs me he bought three Portuguese villages for a song. That would be nice, I thought. A farmhouse with established olives and grapes. I wonder what the internet is like over there. Could I run an internet business from a rural Portuguese village? I really don't know where I want to live when I finish this trip. I think this journey will help me decide. I visit the Fremantle market and think about Horatio's quote, do justice to your talent. I think about the changes the internet has brought about in so many industries. The idea that video content should be free. I look at all the stores, people selling all types of stuff. Why shouldn't people pay for videos, or music, or good journalism? Why should art be tainted by advertising? There and then, I decide to make changes to my own business. If I really want to become a full-time video producer, only producing my own projects, I really have to start acting like one. No more moonlighting as a video producer for other business. No more tainting my product with ads for a pittance thrown from the table of Google. I must set up shop and see if viewers will pay for my stories. I must enter the hustle and bustle of the marketplace and sell my content for what I think it's worth. I look around me. Some store owners smile enticingly. Some are crowded with customers. Others look bored and disheartened. I know who I'd rather approach. To do justice to my talent, I must be present, turn up every day, try and personalise the creator customer experience in a world inundated with digital noise. And maybe this is the secret of art that stands out, when the creator is creating something they love, not following fads or copying others, but just being true to themselves. From Perth I head inland to Australia's only monastic town, New Norcia. Set up by Spanish monks in 1846, they hoped to convert local Aborigines to Catholicism. Visitors can now stay at the monastery in a retreat set up, whereby all meals are provided, and the opportunity exists to learn more about the Benedictine order. A Benedictine monastery aims to be self-sufficient, and despite hardships in the early days, New Norcia is now made up of 20,000 acres of farmland, which derives income from wheat, barley and canola. In its heyday, in the 1870s, 70 monks made up its community. They have run their own bakery, hotel, boarding schools, and even licensed the brewing of their own ale. But these days, the grand school buildings are mainly empty, apart from visiting school excursion groups, and the order now only numbers 11 elderly monks. And very telling to me is that there is not one Aboriginal to be seen. Benedictine monks take a vow of stability, Their days are very regimented, praying on six different occasions. I think of my own gypsy lifestyle and the difficulty in maintaining any kind of regular routine. As Carol King sang, I sure hope the road don't come to own me. Instead of heading to the coast, I decide to take the inland route along the Midland Way, rolling through sleepy rural towns where people mainly work the land and the pubs still display signage of long lost conventions. There is a chill in the afternoon air as I set up a camp between the road and a railway line. That night, two freight trains hurtle by, rattling my fillings and waking me with fright. That morning, the sound of Old Man Crow awakens me from my slumber. I feel very alone, but in a good way. 
As I ride through the countryside, I'm completely surrounded by nature and begin to appreciate the subtle habitat differences as I move through the land. That afternoon, while camping in a woodlot, I'm visited by a red-capped robin. I've come to cherish these free camping experiences, to just be alone in nature. I ride on to Geraldton and decide to continue free camping. With big towns, this is a problem as it means having to be right out on the periphery. I spend a very cold, sleepless night camped near a river. I wake up feeling a bit sick of it all. I seek solace from a friend online. She says, if you could be anywhere you wanted to be, doing whatever you wanted to do, what would you do? Despite the hard night, I said I wouldn't want to change a thing. My answer surprised me. I've been toying with the idea of attaching surf racks to my bike, so as to surf the epic left-handers further up the coast. I talked with a local designer about current board design and whether he knew anyone who could make the racks. In the end, I decide such a plan is too restrictive and that the surf may not even be on when I pass through. Best to just stop in Exmouth for a time and surf the brakes there. I head on to Calbarry and find its famous left-hand surf break as flat as attack. I decide to go off-road into the sand country and reach the national park on dusk, the red rock gorge emblazoned by the setting sun. That night, I think about travel and how a good trip should really change one as a person. This trip has definitely taught me I can survive out here, out here in nature, the thing we seem to fear so much in the West. I've also learned to be alone, and that takes some time to get used to. I think constantly moving has staved off loneliness. Seeing new sights keeps the mind active, and at the end of this trip, I think I will feel a sense of accomplishment and at the very least, know I've learnt the art of motorcycle maintenance. I next decide to visit Hutt River Principality, an independent sovereign state set up by a farmer to fight against an unfair wheat quota law that would have destroyed his livelihood. I meet the sprightly 91-year-old Prince Leonard who gives tours to visitors from all over the world. This is his story. After World War II, the Australian government set up the Australian Wheat Board to acquire all wheat produced and then market that wheat overseas. The idea of the board was to stabilise the industry and shelter growers from volatile market fluctuations by offering a guaranteed price. The bumper wheat harvest in 1968 brought about the idea of a wheat quota, restricting the amount of wheat offered to the market so as to reduce the potential of a surplus which in turn would reduce prices. In 1969, wheat farmer Leonard Casely, who for the previous 20 years produced and sold 6,000 acres of wheat, was given a quota of only 100 acres to sell. He protested the wheat board's decision, but to no avail. The wily wheat farmer then hit the books, studying law. He found an international law called Unjust Enrichment Principle and sent a claim of $52 million to the West Australian government claiming the wheat quota to be unlawful. In return, the government rushed a bill through Parliament, which allowed them to forcefully take Casely's land. Casely burnt the midnight oil, poring over various laws. He found that Land Title Act stated no more than one twentieth of anyone's land can be resumed by the sovereign. 15. All. Just too hot to handle. The government ignored Casely's rightful understanding of the law, and continued to push the new bill through Parliament. Casely was backed into a corner. Everything he'd worked for was about to be taken from under him. He once again hit the law books and found the International Law of Self-Preservation, which gave him the idea of setting up his own government to preserve his lands. On the 21st of April, 1970, Hutt River succeeded from Australia, using another law Casely had read about, the Succession Laws of Great Britain. He just had to name his territory, elect a government and adopt a flag. And there was nothing the Australian government could do. 30, 15. Oh, you can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious! Over the years, various governments have rained down revenge on Casely, but each time he's outsmarted them with his do-it-yourself understanding of various laws from around the world. Laws of war, the Geneva Convention, and British laws of treason have all been used to keep the government at bay. He has declared a three-day war with Australia 
change the status of his province from a republic to a principality, and thus becoming a prince, and suffered numerous attacks over the years from the Australian tax office. At one stage, they garnished half of the funds of his bank accounts, most of which were actually medical reimbursements he'd received for being a war veteran. The government ensured there will never be another Prince Leonard, changing land titles to convey property ownership from a real man to a straw man, a fictitious person, someone who does not exist. In this way, they can now take ownership of anyone's land. I wandered through his sacred educational shrine, set up in memory of his wife, Princess Shirley. He mentions finding what he called a sacred site on one of the peaks of the Capricorn Ranges, a remote mountain range in the Pilbara, a crystal pyramid and three standing stones. The Aborigines told him they didn't venture into this area due to a lack of food and water. As I rode off, I decided I would visit the Capricorn Ranges and search for the mysterious crystal pyramid. I need to find a place to do some solder work on a faulty blinker, so head to Denham. I cruise the industrial area looking for an electrician. I meet George, a POM, who came out to Australia as a lad. He lives on his lot, caring for his wheelchair-bound wife. He offers to let me camp on his lot, and that night he invited me to share a meal of beef stew and home-brew dark ale. One of the great joys of travel are these chance encounters, these moments of trust and abandon, where strangers become friends and everyone is richer for the experience. I head to Monkey Mire, where in the late 50s, fishermen started feeding one dolphin called Charlie. The whole thing has turned into a big tourist attraction now, very controlled and very regimented. It's nice to see the dolphins up close, but it's not really normal, is it, feeding wild animals? Apparently it was leading to an 80% infant mortality rate, which they've managed to turn around recently with feeding restrictions. I wonder what they think when they look at us. I hit the road and notice a change in the environment, the red earth, the desert country. I see wild goats and birds I've only ever seen in books, a black mass of red-tailed black cockatoos. Just on sunset, I enter a designated 24-hour campsite full of grey nomads and van life backpackers. I search for a suitable tent site, but see too much toilet paper littering the ground for my liking, so I decide to find my own solitary camp a little bit up the road, just the way I like it, waking up to the sound of nature. It's a cold night, which takes me a little bit by surprise, giving the scorching daytime temperatures. A morning dew reveals the intricacies of numerous spider webs. I head to Carnarvon and catch a fishing competition at a local pub. Red Emperor and Coral Trout. These are some of the best eating fish in the world. Carnarvon is known as the food bowl of the West. Its 170 plus plantations provide Perth with 70% of their winter fruit and veggies. It's only got a population of about 6,000. But if ever a place deserved a world-class restaurant, it's this place. Fresh seafood, fresh local produce, and a usually great subtropic climate. But I've hit some rain, so I booked myself into a local cabin. I want to visit Red Bluff, a remote surf break about 140 kilometres north. The forecast predicted two metre swells, and I'm keen to see this renowned left-hander in full force. Getting in was a bit of fun, about 50 k's of dirt road, including some wet sand sections. So remote out here, where the desert meets the sea. I find a fantastic campsite overlooking the natural amphitheatre, but not a wave in sight. Oh well, I'll use this time to do a bit of yoga and meditation. Things I was going to do every day. Yeah, right. I get talking to my neighbour, Kelly. He's been to the bluff 23 times. At 36 years of age, he wanted to kill himself. 
and decided drowning was the best way to do it. He'd hit a downward spiral due to drugs and alcohol. He bought a board and somehow managed to get out into the line out in a heavy swell. He tried taking off on a monster, his first wave ever. He got the pummeling of his life. His survival instinct kicked in as he got ragdolled and washed up against the razor sharp rocks of the shore. There and then, he decided to give up his addictions and replace them with surfing and learning guitar. He's 12 years clean. On my way to Exmouth, I realise my speedo has stopped working, so I order a new cable and settle into a week of surfing, getting a campsite at the caravan park near the beach. I have a range of boards I can borrow and start with a fat fish design. My first morning, I ride the two kilometres to the beach with the board under my arm to find small clean surf and a balmy 22 degree water temperature. I'm the second in the water, sharing waves with one other surfer for nearly an hour. Greg is 67 years old and has been surfing for a phenomenal 56 years. After my second day of surfing, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, I wake in the middle of the night with chest pains and difficulty breathing. Is this a heart attack? I call an ambulance and wait about half an hour for them to do the 20 kilometre run from town. Luckily, I've only popped a rib out. I didn't know you could do such a thing. It must have been due to a combination of surfing and sleeping on rock hard ground. The doctor told me I should rest for two weeks. No surfing, no motorcycle riding and no snorkelling. I'm a little peeved. I was enjoying the surfing, but meeting Greg had inspired me. I wasn't sure I'd be able to get back in the surfing after 15 years out of the water, but seeing Greg pushing close to 70 years of age and still surfing like an excited grom was just fantastic. My cable arrived later that week and I feel good enough to be able to ride. I want to snorkel Ningaloo Reef and visit Turquoise Bay where one can drift snorkel only metres from shore. I'm still a bit stiff on my right side but fine with one arm I can still steer myself with the current without feeling too much pain. I'm glad I did it. It's beautiful. Vibrant coral gardens and heaps of fish. That night I dropped my bike in deep sand while looking for a campsite on the outskirts of Exmouth. With my sore rib I just can't lift it. It is just on dusk and luckily I see a caravan pulling in about a kilometre away. I go to get help, scaring the hell out of the poor elderly couple. But luckily me and the old fella can lift the bike together. That night I think about the next stage of my journey, searching for the crystal pyramid Prince Leonard had told me about. Out there in that remote country, if I drop my bike and can't lift it, it could pose a problem. By studying maps, I work out that the nearest civilization to the remote Capricorn Ranges is Ashburton Down Station. My plan is to visit the station and find out if they know how I can get to the Crystal Pyramid. On a remote truck stop on the Northwest Highway, I meet Joyce who runs a takeaway food bus selling burgers. She also runs Emu Creek Station, 310,000 acres of red earth country, running only 1,000 to 1,100 head of drought master cattle. I tell her of my plans to visit the Capricorn Ranges. She says, You'll get sand from here on in. Watch out for the blackfellas' dogs. They get paid $10 a day to feed them, but don't. They form big packs of up to 50. The locals out here don't camp alone. Light a fire at night to keep the bastards away. I take the turn off to Ashburton Downs. I calculate to take this trip, I'll take my supplies right to the edge. Fuel, water, food. That night, as I camp out, the sound of scrub bulls breaking the silence, I wonder what it is that drives men to explore. Is it that in searching for the unknown, we hope to find ourselves? The next morning I visit the homestead. Stereotypes are broken, with most of the workers here being female. I speak with Andrew, the owner, 
for my plans to find the pyramid. He is a little amused and informs me the range is about 30 kilometres from the homestead. He draws up a rough mud map on a piece of paper. Rough country out there. I don't want to have to come and save ya. I told him I'll spend the night out there and return before noon tomorrow. It's pretty harsh country. Ashburton Downs covers 870,000 acres, running a mere 8 to 10,000 head of cattle. The mining tracks I follow haven't been maintained for half a century. Fields of huge boulders and Sandy Creek bed washouts. I'm determined not to drop my bike, knowing with my pop rib I wouldn't be able to lift it. find what looks like the Capricorn Ranges, five mountain peaks running on a straight line east to west. I find a load of copper ore and some empty beer bottles to suggest the area had been mined. The fourth peak was where the crystal pyramid was supposed to be. I hit the last of my food, using my bike for shade. I then climbed to the top in the searing midday heat. I couldn't find any trace of the crystal pyramid and decided to set up camp for the night, top the mount. It doesn't really worry me that I didn't find the pyramid. I'm completely alone in this timeless landscape. I have no fear. I feel confident in my ability to get myself in and get myself out of this remote location. That morning, I whistle up the sun, a slight echo resonating across the vast silent valley below. I've never been alone in such a harsh environment. I'm overcome with awe. I feel very small, but also connected to all that surrounds me. An immense feeling of well-being comes over me. I head back to the homestead, tell Andrew what I've found. Nah mate, that wasn't the right mountain. You were 10k shy. Oh well, somewhere out there the crystal pyramid remains. I may not have found it, but I did find something, something within. A belief in myself to be able to go out into the desert like the mystics of the past, to be alone with my thoughts and to be totally comfortable with that. In Tom Price, I met an ex-Dutch soldier travelling around Australia in a camper van. Eric had served in Bosnia and Afghanistan. He had lost soldier friends to suicide and had experienced the effects of post-traumatic stress syndrome himself. A turning point for him was when he used to do patrols around remote villages in Afghanistan. His translator would show the tribesmen a photo of the Twin Towers. No one ever recognised it. In Perth, I'd met a guy who ran tours all around Australia. He told me Karajini National Park was one of the most beautiful, unique landscapes he'd ever seen. Huge gorges divide the land, providing sustenance and painting a rich palette, contrasting the red earth with the subtle greens, whites and yellows. But rain has arrived, a heavy downpour, closing many roads. I have to think about where I will camp for the night and decide to do a run to Munjana Roadhouse and book a cabin. It pretty much rains all day. I'm soaked to the bone, and to add to the fun of it all, The road is heavy with four carriage road trains. It's a pretty hardcore day of riding, but I have to ride on, because out here, there is nowhere else to stop. At one stage, I shake my fist at the sky and shout, is that all you've got? I've been here before. I know I can handle it. I know I will arrive at that roadhouse absolutely drenched, and after a long hot shower, I'll feel a true sense of being alive, of achievement, of being able to handle anything the road throws at me. I hear of a local cattle station that allows farm stays. Every night, the hosts, Colin and Betty, invite guests into the homestead for happy hour. 
It is bring your own drinks and they provide some nibblies. This kind of outback hospitality is something I love. It represents an Australia of old where people still knew their neighbours. Unfortunately, Colin is undergoing cancer treatment. I find it fascinating that he's using Aboriginal treatments in his recovery, maroon bush and the sap of a local bloodwood, and a form of reiki called mobbin. I had no idea the Aborigines used reiki, but could find very little mention of it in later online searches. The next morning, I meet a few crew who have gathered for the yearly cattle muster. The head musterer asked me if I want to tag along and take some photos. Once again, I must say I was surprised by the amount of women working on the station. The copter pilot is a woman, and I joined Danny, one of several women driving the bull buggies. The bull buggies and the four-wheel motorcycles look like something out of Mad Max with reinforcements to protect against charging cattle. soon learn why the bars were needed when Danny tries to bring a rogue bull back to the gathering flock. We call in the Air Force and manage to get Mr Grumpy back to the mob. The rest of the muster went by without a hitch and gave me time to think about why it surprised me find so many women working out in these remote places. In the cities, there is a movement happening at the moment called diversity and inclusion. The idea is to set up job quotas related to sex and race. Not for collecting your rubbish, mind you, just for all the cushy government jobs and funding. Out here in nature, it is survival of the fittest. Out here on this station, these women, or Aborigines, or foreign backpackers, aren't given their roles due to some ridiculous idea of tokenism. They get these jobs because they earn them. And that is what built this country, not awards for second prize. A mate in Sydney told me I should visit the Burrup Peninsula near Karratha. He told me the area has some of the world's oldest petroglyphs, which are images carved into rock. He told me nearby local industry, a liquid natural gas plant and two ammonia gas plants were destroying the art due to acid emissions. I'd never heard of the Burrup art before and I'm extremely lucky to arrive at the car park just when a local accountant, Gary Slee, is about to start a free tour. Gary is very passionate about the art at Murujuga, as the Aboriginals call it. He holds up his walking stick and tells us, On the tip here, this is how long white men have been here. Jesus was a pup about here, 2,000 years ago. Stonehenge was built four to 5,000 years ago. There was an ice age around 20,000 years ago. And way back here, at the end of this stick, 30 to 40,000 years ago, this is when this art gallery started. This is the world's oldest and largest collection of rock carvings. Estimates range from 300,000 to 1 million individual pieces. In the last three years alone, 15,000 previously undocumented petroglyphs have been found. It is amazing to see how the art changes over time. The older pieces, known as archaic faces, have elaborate geometric patterns and the first recorded representation of a human face Later, around the Ice Age, things get simpler. Stick figures and records of wildlife, long extinct megafauna, and later still, 4,000 years ago, carvings of a Tasmanian tiger. All around are signs of a rich cultural life, grinding stones and cockle shells, to take away food after the ice melted and place Murujuga closer to the sea. I'm absolutely gobsmacked by the artwork. It is awe-inspiring, to think that Australia has the oldest continuous record 
of human artistic endeavour carved deep in stone. In the early 1960s, the West Australian government decided to use the Burrup Peninsula as an outlet port for the iron ore industry. It has since become an industrial zone with intensive mining, shipping and processing. It is claimed that since 1963, 24% of the rock art has been destroyed to make way for industrial development. In 2008, the Burrup was given natural heritage listing but pre-existing industries are still allowed to coexist with the now 44% of the Burrup declared National Park. There is a current push to give Murujuga World Heritage listing. We inspected a monitoring station near a fertiliser plant. There is a concern that the toxic ammonia gas released from the plant will destroy the surface patina of the rock art and cause images to disappear and discolour possibly within one lifetime. I then ride on to Port Hedland, Australia's largest port, shipping iron ore off to China. I see the modern day petroglyphs silhouetted across the landscape, huge machines digging up the ground. I watch their monotonous toil. I think of the Aborigines 40,000 years ago, having a culture that appreciated art, of making time to leave a legacy that has outlived all other art. Truly amazing. I was looking forward to visiting Broome because I was meeting up with Evelyn again. She was up there to sell some jewellery. We book into McAlpine House, a tastefully renovated 1910 Pearling Masters College that at one stage was owned by Lord McAlpine, a former aide to Margaret Thatcher. He pretty much founded tourism here. Evelyn then invited me to join her in house sitting a friend's house. And what a house it was. An architect designed rebuild of an old Pearling Masters College with half an acre of tropical forests, a pool, and just like Bunjil, two dogs. July is one of the best times to be in Broome, with low humidity, warm days, and clear blue skies. We slowly eased into local time, visiting the beach, outdoor markets, both day and night, and watching the iconic sunset at Cable Beach, where the sun slowly disappears behind the endless ocean. We visit the Crocodile Park, where I meet Dave, who near every day in the tourism season gets to share his love of reptiles with visiting families. The saltwater crocodile is one of the few apex creatures one has to look out for up here, particularly when close to coastal waterways. It is a beautiful time, a great break from my life on the road, but towards the end, It is also a sad time. I think we both realise our lifestyles are very different. And that is all I wish to say. The next section of the trip was something I'd been looking forward to, a testing 660 kilometres of rough dirt roads stretching from Derby to Kununurra. The Gibb River Road takes one through the remote Kimberley region, known for its numerous Aboriginal art sites and spectacular scenery. I'd added some knobby tyres to my bike and broom and was looking forward to seeing how my suspension modifications would hold up in such a gruelling environment. The landscape changed soon after leaving Broome boab trees and termite mounds. I pull into a roadhouse to feast on a truck stop feed of local marinated eye fillet steak, still on the bone, 
washed down with a local beer affectionately known as Bushchook. I've come to enjoy the silence of the bush and my first night out camping is like a meditation. I ride on to Derby where I set up for lunch under the shade of a tree on the edge of town. I still have some wine and cheese from Broome, some runny camembert and a rather warm super Tuscan. I put on a bit of the sax squawk of Bowie's last album and settle in for a relaxing break from the dust and the heat of the road. I'm approached by five Aboriginals who asked to join me. They were from the remote dry community of Columbaroo. They were in town for a funeral and enjoying their freedom with a slab of warm bush jooks. They offer me one, which I politely accept. I offer them some cheese and crackers, and for one of the women, it was her first taste of camembert, and she rather enjoyed it. That's how they do it in Melbourne, she said to her sister. All fancy like, camel burnt and wine. I have a giggle at her mispronunciation. They are good people, traditional Aboriginals. They really look out for each other. Humble, polite, and a great sense of humour. But it did sadden me when I later rode past the thriving bottle shop of the pub to see a kidney dialysis unit directly across the road. The first day on the dirt and my bike is sliding round a bit. The roads are pretty rough and I find by letting the pressure down on my tyres I gain traction and at least 10 kilometres more per hour in top speed. I visit Windjammer Gorge which 360 million years ago was Ocean Reef. This was the period in time when fish started to grow legs and leave the water. You could see the skeletons of sea creatures on the rocks and the pools were filled with freshwater crocodiles. I then ride on to Galvin Gorge where I see my first Wanjana, a ghost-like Aboriginal creator spirit, said to bring rain. They are painted without a mouth, as it is said, if they had one and could speak, they would be too powerful. I see a dingo on the side of the road. He didn't seem too scared of me. I'd had a few approach my camp at night, just to take a look. There was some wild cattle around. I wasn't sure if a bull would attack me when camping, so at night I set my bike up next to a tree in case I had to climb it. You could hear the bulls bellowing at each other at night and the mob would graze close enough to my tent that I could hear them chewing. But I love it out here. Where else can I be completely alone in nature, with no sign of humans, as far as the eye could see? The next morning I ride on to the Barnet River Gorge, where I walk the rough track to the head of the river, I wanted to have the place to myself, and I did for the whole morning. I swim in the pristine waters and warm myself in the sun. I feel like in these beautiful natural places, your body becomes in tune with nature. It's hard to explain, but it's kind of like you get into sync with the natural rhythm of things. I wanted to visit the Aboriginal art site called King Edward River, or Munaru. To get there, I travel some rough country and have to cross a few rivers. I have the whole place to myself, just amazing. An open air art gallery, rocky outcrops and caves, absolutely covered in art. More Wanjinas, a burial site, and the mysterious Bradshaw or Gwyngwyn art, said to be up to 25,000 years old. The long limbed people depicted in this art kind of looked African to me. The Gwyngwyn art is an older art movement than the Wanjinas, which only date back about 4,000 years. It just blew me away. As I wander around, I imagine the sight at night, lit by fire sticks, the sound of ceremony, clapping sticks and didgeridoo. Such a special place. That night, I felt this is where I end my film. This is the pinnacle. I've seen remnants of the rich cultural history of my country. I've learnt of the grounding and healing nature of being alone in the wild. I feel at peace with myself and the world around me. I couldn't hope for more. The next day, I decide to ride back to civilization, onward to Kununurra, 
I feel very much in sync with my bike, everything working, all my research and preparation paying off. I feel like Toby Price in the Dakar. I do 300 kilometres of rough dirt corrugations, dust and river crossings. The bike performing like it's on rails. The tyres, the suspension, everything working a treat. I feel invincible. I've gone from being a guy who was actually afraid to take a wheel off my bike to someone competent in doing repairs. I've learnt that being alone in nature isn't something to be scared of, but instead something that offers us a unique perspective of our own place in the world. And most importantly, I've grown to love my country again, to appreciate its rich cultural heritage, to reconcile myself with its vicious colonial past, and to understand that to move on, we must recognise our similarities in order to overcome our differences. I've met men older than me, men living extraordinary lives. They've taught me life doesn't end with middle age, I know what I want now. Youth has given me experience, and every day from this moment on truly is a blessing. My journey is over. I hope you've enjoyed the ride. And one day, I hope you too can see this great country.